So I'll tell you about our work to develop an uh, alpaca-derived uh, single-chain uh, antibodies uh, that are reactive to the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And all of the authors on the work I'm going to show you are uh, situated at the Karolinsk Institute in Stockholm, most of us in this new building here that we just moved into uh, last year. So most of you will, will recognize this, of course, as the artist representation of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, spike uh, uh, particle. And shown in blue is the spike uh, complex, which is the main complex for interaction with the, with the host cell receptors and which um, is a major target for uh, antibodies, both by the immune system and also by us that are trying to develop uh, such antibodies as, as potential therapeutic uh, or diagnostic agents. Uh, and so very early this year, uh, when the genome of the virus was published, as you pro probably most of you know, the uh, Jason McClellan's lab uh, reacted very quickly and cloned a version of the spike complex that uh, is, it contains a number of, uh, um, the spike protein, I'm sorry, that contains a number of uh, mutations in the central helix that uh, stops the virus from undergoing the conformational changes that are associated with uh, fusion with the whole cell membrane. And so that locks the, the, the protein in the pre-fusion uh, state. And that allowed these authors to solve the uh, three-dimensional structure of that complex by cryo-electron microscopy. And many of you have seen this image, I'm sure. Uh, it's just, just to, worth talking a little about. So here is shown the trimeric complex, where one monomer is in gray, one in white, and one in the colored uh, ribbon diagram associated with the uh, same colors as on the, on the domain structure up here. And what we can see is that the uh, receptor binding domain, which is this domain uh, uh, at the very tip of the complex, is present in two conformations. And shown here in the green is uh, the domain in the up conformation that is thought to be the more, more likely uh, one that interacts with the receptor. And the other two are shown in the down conformation that is the um, believed to be a, an immune evasion uh, mechanism that this complex has. And so this, because of this critical step in the life cycle, this is a major target for neutralizing antibodies by many people, uh, many researchers around, around the world. And our particular um, uh, strategy was to use single chain antibodies from camelids, particularly uh, alpacas. So um, as you may be aware, camels and llamas and alpacas and other animals in this family, uh, as well as expressing conventional antibodies that look uh, similar to uh, those in, in other uh, mammals, also express uh, single chain uh, antibodies, which are heavy chain only. We've lost one of the constant domains, such that the interaction with the light domain is lost. Uh, and, never, so, and so these molecules are expressed as a, as a single domain, although it's a, it's a dimeric uh, molecule. Uh, and importantly, because they're expressed from a single gene, they can be more readily cloned from cells uh, rather than the, the, the two uh, uh, strands that are necessary for the cloning of conventional antibodies. Uh, and we can also in the lab further minimize this structure to, to just show, um, uh, uh, try and minimize this screen here. Yeah. So just to show, uh, to, so just the variable domain, which we refer to then as VHH or uh, nanobody. And this, and these nanobodies are about 15 kilodaltons. So approximately one tenth of the size of conventional antibodies. Nevertheless, maintaining um, uh, antibody uh, antigen specificity and uh, to a large extent affinity as well. So they've been very useful uh, uh, molecules, uh, both as molecular biology tools, which is why we were interested in them uh, pre-COVID-19, uh, but also uh, as potential therapeutic agents for, for disease. Uh, and so it's just an example of some of the things that one can do with these molecules is, uh, and I'll show you some examples of some of this, is that uh, we can make uh, direct uh, conjugates with fluorophores uh, to make uh, uh, tools for microscopy studies. Uh, we can uh, uh, functionalize them with many different uh, uh, side chains and uh, uh, other types of molecules. We can also make uh, homodimers and oligomers uh, and even and hetero uh, dimers as well for, for various reasons. And I'll show some work that we've been doing with that. And then uh, a lot of people have been, and us included, have been using them as uh, chaperones for crystallography and also for cryo EM uh, to, to be able to solve uh, structures of, of flexible uh, proteins. If you, if you bind a, a ligand of known structure to them, you can, you can more easily, uh, in some cases, uh, solve the structure. 
Um, so this slide is just to give some uh, of the uh, some of the um, advantages to why we use these uh, molecules uh, potentially as as um, therapeutic uh, agents. Uh, and I won't go through too many details, but just to point out that uh, because they've lost the light chain, they, they thought that they kind of um, have evolved to have longer and more flexible CDRs, particularly the CDR3. So that's the region of the variable domain that interacts with the antigens. And it's thought that these uh, long CDRs can penetrate into molecular clefts or, or small uh, spaces that conventional antibodies can't do. And there has been one that's, that has passed uh, FDA approval. So it has been shown that even though they are proteins from different species, they can be humanized and they can pass these regulatory hurdles that are required. Uh, and as well as that, they, as well as uh, all these advantages, they lack FC regions. So the potential of antibody mediated enhancement of infection uh, effects are, are not seen. So my interest in uh, alpaca derived nanobodies started in 2017 when Leo Hanke was a very uh, talented postdoc joined my lab. Um, and his idea was to make panels of nanobodies against the chikungunya alpha virus, uh, non-structural proteins, uh, um, by immunizing alpacas with, with proteins recombinantly expressed in the lab and then selecting for them using different uh, techniques. And, and so Leo was getting to a very productive stage of this project uh, in January this year. Uh, and we started having a lot of discussions with Ben Merle, who is an assistant professor in our department and who's very interested in antibody generation um, previously for HIV, but uh, uh, now during the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, got became very interested in, in this virus as well. And so Ben's lab and, and us, we decided to pool our resources and to mobilize our nanibody identification platform for the um, development of, yeah, of nanobodies against the, the RBD, in, in particular of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So this is just a, a word about the proteins we used in the immunizations that I'll tell you about. So we got the clone from the McClellan lab of this stabilized prefusion spike complex, which uh, took us a while to get uh, uh, working the, the protein expression. Uh, but in the meantime, because we wanted to react fast back in, in February, we bought some recombinant S1 protein and we also cloned ourselves the RBD uh, and, and we were able to express this in-house. And so we were used these two soluble forms of the spike protein in our initial immunizations because we wanted to get uh, started pretty quickly. And that's what we did. So together with our uh, colleagues in Germany at the Preclinics Research Farm, we immunized, this is Tyson, the uh, alpaca that we received our first immunizations. Uh, and Tyson received two immunizations with the S1 protein and two of the RBD that we cloned uh, ourselves. Uh, over a 60-day period. And towards the end of that period, we received some serum as a, a control, and we were able to show with a simple Western blot that um, uh, Tyson's serum reacted very strongly to the spike protein and to the uh, RBD. Uh, so we were very confident that at this point we had a strong antibody response in the animal. And we also performed some pseudovirus neutralization assays just to see if we were able to uh, if, if Tyson's uh, serum uh, contained any neutralizing activity. And of course, this could be, and, and this result here as well, could be from conventional antibodies as well as those of the single chain variety. But we were happy to see that there was some neutralization activity. Um, it's a little bit lower than we might have hoped, but we knew that there are at least some neutralizing antibodies in uh, the animal at this, at this point in the immunization. And so in order to screen out the nanobody sequences, uh, we cloned uh, all of them and, and expressed them in, in a, a, a phage display library so that we could uh, pan uh, immobilized RBD domain uh, for, uh, pan the library in order to select for uh, strong binders. And, and so we did, uh, we did binding screens uh, after two rounds of phage display and also uh, next generation sequencing at the baseline and also after one and after two rounds of uh, uh, panning on the RBD. Uh, and what this, uh, this slide is just showing that there's there were a number of nanobody sequences that increased in proportion uh, after those two rounds, but none more so than uh, this one antibody, which we called uh, Tai-1, because we thought it was the, the best one. It was um, enriched uh, uh, 10 to the five fold after two rounds of phage display. 
And uh, we also knew from the binding screens that it was a, a very strong binder and a, a good, a, a, that it expressed very well and behaves well in, in all the ways that a protein biochemist would like a protein to behave. So uh, in, the, in the spirit of, of um, wanting to be quick at, at the start of the uh, uh, pandemic earlier this year, we decided to proceed with our downstream experiments with just this one uh, nanobody, Taiwan. And this is the sequence of the nanobody here, which we also um, uh, presented in our bioarchive uh, paper and also in the published uh, manuscript. So the first thing we wanted to do uh, is to see if the uh, nanobody uh, recognizes the spike protein in infected cells. And so we, we got some of the virus from the first infected patients here in Sweden. And we infected Vero E6 cells and we stained them with a directly conjugated uh, 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 Tai-1 uh, fluorophore, uh, and together with double-stranded RNA antibody, and you can see that the cells that are, are positive for either one are, are, are positive for the other as well. So we, we're quite confident from this result that the Tai-1 nanobody recognizes the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein uh, from, the, from the Swedish strain, uh, and also importantly, doesn't recognize anything in the mock-infected uh, Vero E6 cells. So that was a good um, uh, 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 good evidence for us that it was a very specific antibody as well as being a strong binder. Uh, we also showed that we can use it in flow cytometry, so we can we can uh, label spike expressing 293 T cells uh, quite strongly, but not uh, non-transfected cells. And and so this uh, shows that this um, you know backs up this data, shows that the, the antibody, the nanobody, is specific. Also. Uh, gives some evidence that it's a very useful uh, tool for detection of the protein in, in a number of different readouts. But what's more important, of course, is whether this nanobody was neutralizing. And to do, to do the initial experiments, we did a pseudovirus uh, neutralization assays where we uh, produced lentiviruses expressing, uh, car ca carrying on their surface the, either the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein uh, or the VSVG spike protein as control. Uh, in both cases expressing luciferase, so we could use luciferase uh, expression as a readout for viral entry, and this is a commonly used um, uh, experiment. And so uh, simply we, we pre-incubate the virus with the nanobody, and we show that as we increase the concentration of the nanobody, we get, we get lower and lower uh, luciferase expression, suggesting that the nanobody really does block infection with this pseudovirus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus but not with the VSVG pseudovirus and that an irrelevant nanobody is also not able to block that. So that was quite uh, uh, good evidence that this is a neutralizing nanobody. Uh, so I told you about some of the ways in which the protein can be uh, modulated. So what we did in this was we expressed a bivalent construct by expressing it in fusion with the human, uh, with FC from the human IgG. Uh, to make up this bivalent uh, uh, construct. And, and this, this uh, Taiwan FC, as we call it, is, is much more potent as a neutralizer than the uh, monomeric um, Taiwan. So we're getting IC50 of approximately uh, 12 uh, nanograms per mil for this construct, putting it in the range of some of the better uh, antibodies uh, that have been described. Uh, and so sort of uh, inspired by this in a, in a more recent side project that I just want to take one slide to present, we're, we're preparing this now for publication, but uh, we decided to make a number of different dimeric and also a tetrameric uh, complex using a, a combination of uh, sortes and click uh, protein biochemistry in order to make them. And so you see what, what we've done here and, and the proteins uh, on a gel. Uh, in the pseudovirus neutralization assay, uh, all of these dimeric or bivalent uh, um, constructs behave very similarly. Those are the black lines, uh, uh, whereas a, a tetrameric construct, the forearm peg tetramer, uh, is much more um, um, uh, potent. And, and here we're getting uh, IC50s in the picomolar range. So this is a very potent uh, construct. Um, and we also performed uh, plaque neutralization assays. Uh, this data is a little noisier, of course, because it's a much more uh, yeah, low throughput assay, but we get similar results that this the, uh, uh, pentameric, or, or sorry, tetrameric uh, complex is much more um, potent. Back to the original story, um, we were, were lucky that very 
close to us, in fact, just across the corridor, we have a, a, a very talented structural biology group, uh, Martin Halberry and his colleagues, who were interested in solving the uh, structure of the complex of the spike uh, in, in complex with our uh, nanobodies. Uh, when, and so when we're, they were available, we gave um, some of the proteins to uh, Martin and his colleague Rishi Keshe, who were able to solve the structure of Taiwan nanobody bound to the um, trimeric uh, 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 spike glycoprotein. And this is the, the glycoprotein in the prefusion uh, comp, uh, uh, state, as, as, as described by the McClellan lab. And two things I want to draw your attention to here, and one is that uh, there are three molecules of Tai-1 that are bound to the, to the complex, uh, telling us that the, the Tai-1 is able to bind to the RBD in both the up and the down conformations, uh, so that if this down conformation is, is an uh, antibody evasion mechanism, then it's, it doesn't work against these single chain, uh, at least this single chain uh, nanobody, and others that have been published recently show the same thing. And also, just looking at the at the, the 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 structure here, we can see that in this RBD here in the up conformation, uh, Tai one really is bind, bound uh, at an epitope that largely over over overlaps with the receptor binding site. And so we believe that's uh, well, that's the reason why the uh, nanobody is so potently um, um, neutralizing. And if we look at a little bit uh, more uh, detail at that complex, um, uh, we see that, uh, yeah, as I said, Tai-1 uh, is bound to an epitope that overlaps largely, but not entirely, with the ACE2 interaction surface. Um, uh, and when we look in a bit more closer, we see another reason why we think this is such a potent uh, neutralizer is that um, if we model ACE2 into the, into the conformation, is, uh, if the, the spike was binding to it, uh, and Tai-1 is present, then there's a steric clash, as you would expect, since it overlaps with the interaction site. But uh, the Tai-1 molecule that would be bound to the neighboring RBD in the down conformation, uh, just by, by its presence there, uh, it uh, confers another steric clash on the ACE2, uh, uh, so that it can't, um, can't come close to, to binding to the RBD, even if this is not bound by Tai-1. So, we believe that this sort of supports the the potency of the neutralization of the of the uh, of the nanobody, and so this this story uh, from the day we received the cells from the animal until we put it up on bioarchive was uh, just over five weeks. So it just shows that this kind of thing can be done very rapidly uh, under pandemic conditions. Uh, although the sort of conventional publication took a little bit longer, even though the uh, manuscripts are very similar. Um, so we're very uh, happy to be able to have presented that so early. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, because as I said, we wanted to be quick, and so we had immunized Tyson with um, the soluble S1 and the RBD proteins. But we also, once we had the production of the full spike complex uh, working, uh, we immunized a second animal who's a, a female alpaca, and this time called Funny. Uh, and here she is, not a great picture, but um, Funny received four immunizations of the full spike complex. Um, and if you remember this data I showed already, this was Tyson, this was the neutralizing activity in Tyson's serum, which was, you know, detectable but weak, whereas uh, Funny has a much, much stronger uh, neutralizing antibody response in her, in her B-cell compartment. And uh, we're currently cloning out, or we have cloned out panels of uh, uh, nanobodies from the uh, spike protein. We've We've panned them against the RBD, but also against our, uh, the spike in, with soluble RBD in competition in order to try to get nanobodies to other domains. Uh, and we're not um, finished with that work yet, but we definitely do have some nanobodies that are RBD binding and neutralizing, and some that are not RBD binding and also neutralizing. So that'll be very exciting to figure out where in this complex they bind. And that work is in preparation at the moment. So just to, for me to, uh, maybe I spoke rather rapidly, but um, uh, just for me to um, uh, acknowledge, so as I mentioned, Leo from my lab, who brought the technology to the Karolinski Institute that, uh, 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 and together with Ben Merle from the neighboring lab, um, have really been the main drivers of this project, uh, working uh, extremely rapidly and extremely well during those few months in the spring. Other members of my lab were involved as well in the cloning and uh, screening. 
Uh, Dan in Ben's lab set up the neutralization assay for this project and many others. Uh, and we, so my lab, Ben Murrell's lab and Gunilla Crossan Hedesam's lab here at KI are the sort of main partners in an EU funded consortium, which we call Coronab, uh, which allowed us to, to get this work uh, done so rapidly, uh, which was a sort of public health emergency funding that was released in February uh, this year. Uh, thanks to uh, Adnan Ashur and Tim Schulte for some biophysical analysis of the binding complexes, which I didn't have time to talk about, and uh, Martin and Rishikesh, who performed the beautiful cryo uh, work. And I'll stop there and thank you again for the invitation and thank you for the uh, yeah, chance to talk to you about our work. Am I? Uh, Andrea, are you there? This is Eric. Um, maybe we to wonder if I was offline or something. Yeah, no, maybe we. No, no, sorry, I wasn't oh, okay. online. I just uh, my my internet was acting up. <laughs> so, sorry. Thank you, Gerald. Um, so we're going to go into into question. I don't see any question at this point in time. Um, so, if anybody wants to ask a question, please raise your hands. Um, Andrea, perhaps I could ask a question? Yes, please. This is David. Um, Joe, could, could you comment on the pharmacokinetics of these uh, uh, nanobodies in, in humans and, and also immunogenicity challenges? Yeah, no, these are, these are great questions. Um, we, haven't, we haven't done any experiments in those lines. Uh, I know that um, others have looked at, uh, how, you know, when you give these uh, um, nanobodies to mice and that they're very, very quickly um, um, sorted out and, and they, they, go, they go very rapidly to the kidney and are, you know, excreted then in the urine. So they don't stick around very long. Um, and immunogenicity could also be a problem if you, if you were to give uh, patients, these nano, nanobodies a lot, they would likely develop some um, response against the antibodies. Uh, d two ways around that, and one is to, when they can be humanized, they're very small, so they can be humanized with just a few mutations uh, that, that sort of get largely get around that. Um, but also we kind of envisage, and we, we, we haven't really done anything in this line, but we, you know, as a, as a, um, Others are sort of further ahead than us, but um, we kind of imagine that the nanobodies would be given as an acute uh, treatment, perhaps just as an inhaler in, in the lungs rather than uh, systemically. So we don't know if, if generation of, um, of an immune response would be, would be a major problem in, in that case. Um, but again, we, this is not our expertise and we haven't been looking at those things. Gerald, I may have missed this, but are there fundamental pharmacokinetics differences between nanobodies and, and antibodies. I mean, nanobodies are smaller, right? So, yeah. So they, yeah, exactly. They, they don't stick around very long and they, there are some tricks one can do to, to you know, pegulate them and, and uh, other, other modifications that can be made that, that allow them to stick around a bit longer. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is an issue. And if they were to be given uh, systemically, it would be, it would be a major problem. But I think, you know, as an acute treatment under, under, you know, early in infection, they could perhaps be, uh, be useful that way. And what about half time? Are there half time differences in, uh, in the two molecules classes? Yeah. Um, again, I, I can't comment on that specifically, but I would be, yeah, I would think so. I would think that they're, 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 um, yeah. Okay. It's, it's excreted quite rapidly. 